Okay, um, so my next question is for Gaylene. Um, talking a little bit about you know working with athletes and seeing the importance in marketing athletes specifically you know in the sport um, I think there's somewhat of a disconnect today um, these all the, a lot of the brands in the industry has gone mainstream so you have a lot of fashion influence you have a lot of music influence um, what are your thoughts in terms of the importance of incorporating athletes and doing things like you guys did where like literally there wasn't even a women's Pro, like women's specific product and a pro model. So, you know, why did you see that that was important to push and how did you even make that happen? Like, you know, you were up against a lot of odds. You know, you're, you were telling me that, you know, you kind of just had to figure it out. So can you tell us a little bit about how that, you know, process was? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Lisa's alluded to it. You've alluded to it. There was, there was some momentum going on with women at that time. Um, we launched the Shannon's pro model in 1993, right? Um, but before that, of course, there were women, that were girls that were sponsored, uh, a lot of girls that were sponsored. And I think for a lot of girls coming into the sport, the normal was that we just rode whatever was there. And we wore the guy's clothes and we rode the guy's boards. I mean, I rode a mini Palmer, you rode a mini Palmer. And as a marketing person and a small person, like Shannon and I wear the same size feet, we were really challenged with the equipment. And I did other sports too, like windsurfing and mountain bike riding, where you had to modify the equipment for your size. So I got to go to Europe with, with Sims and go to the factories and see the cores and talk to the engineers about the product. And I'm looking at the board that I'm riding, and I rode in Whistler with a lot of guys that were pretty aggressive snowboarders. and I had to work really hard to keep up with these guys riding. And like we all did, right? And I always felt like, gosh, I can't have my equipment being at a disadvantage because I'm already smaller and slower than they are. <laughs> so the ideas of creating better equipment for women just came along with as we started becoming, you know, a, a bigger force. And that became, that was because of the evolution and the way we really grouped together. I met Lisa early on. I mean, I started in 88 in Whistler, just riding with a bunch of guys. And I knew two girls, and we would be like scared to ride the half pipe. When they'd leave town, we'd go, oh, good. We can ride the half pipe this weekend, because they're going to a contest. <laughs> um, and, but we rode guys' equipment, and it didn't fit right, but we didn't know any better. Like We were talking today, Kathleen and I, what we used to do to modify like our, my little size five for Sorrells. I'd put a stomp pad in the bottom it was so much lateral movement. I put like these downfield ski mitts in the top and, and, and then your heel would come out. And so your riding style was horrible because you'd have to throw yourself forward for a toe turn because your toe came to the middle of the board. And then on the heel turn, your heel would come up and catch on the top of the binding and you have to push it down. And I just knew that, you know, from other sports, there's a better way. And as a marketing person, I was writing the copy for the catalogs. So I learned all about it. And I'm writing how amazing this Palmer Pro Model performed in steep terrain and torsion box construction. I'm like, I want that. <laughs> and so I think the challenge from a business perspective was that there, there were no numbers to prove out whether the investment was worth it. And I think, like Lisa said earlier, we didn't come up against so much sexism as just like, why would we make a board for you guys when, you know, it probably won't sell because there's not that many of you. And, and a lot of girls did ride guys boards and had no problem. If they were taller or had bigger feet, they didn't have a problem. Um, so I think, you know, women were recognized with, with pro models, Lisa Vintagera for sure. There was a, a lot of girls, especially in Europe and around the world that were very well recognized that we're getting in the magazines and we're getting ads. Um, but what we really wanted was that board that was really designed with the flex and the stance and the width. And that was the hard thing. And that was Shannon's board. And it, it was a big accomplishment um, for us in the industry. And it was a big deal because there were a couple battles. One, to get the mold. And the fight that we had was these molds cost a lot of money, and every year when we come up with the board designs, there were too many boards in the line, and we always had to cut a bunch. 
And so the idea of a women's board came up on the table you know, a year before, and then it got cut, and then the next year, it's like, they go, well, you know what? We'll give you the mini Palmer mold, and you can make that a girls' board, but you can't put girls' graphics on it, because we're not sure it's gonna sell, and then, what are we gonna do with this girls' board? It was a commitment that everyone was in the industry was afraid to make, and I really applaud the couple of companies that really stepped out and allowed it, because most of them were run by men. Lisa, Kathleen, uh, Mickey, we all had the opportunity to influence that and we really exercised that and we teamed up together and we planned and we strategized and we synchronized launches and tours to get, you know, and Tina and Shannon were great representatives because not only were they ripping riders um, and they were, you know, riding the half pipe as good as any guy, and, but they were, you know, they had the right spirit to invite other women in the sport. And they really validated through their clothing line and through the Sims board, I don't know if you guys know about it, but it had big sunflowers on it. And that was a real battle that we had to win <laughs> because the fear was, God, we're gonna come out with this board with flowers on it? And like. They tried to not. Yeah, they said, <laughs> well, so I, I drew the sunflower board <clears throat> and then they looked at it and then they're like, oh, it's no, how about this one? And it was like this bird that looked like it was gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, great, and it was so sad. And I'm like, I'm not riding that, yeah. I'm not. And then Galen pushed it, she's like, listen, it's either that one or nothing, basically, right? Yeah, know. it was, <laughs> well basically, I personally had to sign off that if the board didn't sell, I would like buy all of them myself <laughs> 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 and sell them. <laughs> so, <laughs> So what I did, there was like a little marketing story that a couple of these girls know, but <laughs> what happened was back then, not only was it getting the company and the pro riders, but you had to get it into the stores. And if you ever, you know, have gone through the process of design and then selling into reps and then selling into the stores, there's this whole trickle down effect. And I had seen it with some of the girls' clothes that were making, they weren't selling it. But when I would wear it or you would wear it, people would go, wow, where'd you get that? But I'd look at the numbers and no one, had it in any store. And it's because the reps weren't showing it because they were like, well, no one's gonna buy this anyway. So I thought, I don't want that to happen to this board because you know, we have to, I have to sell all these boards. <laughs> so what, so I, what I did was I ordered 100 samples to be delivered for the March show at SIA. And I sent one home with like 100 top dealers of ours. And I knew that if they got in the store, there'd be a girl that worked in the shop or the guy that owned the shop, his wife or girlfriend would ride it and would love it, because we loved that board, <laughs> we rode amazing. And that's what happened. And then they came back and ordered like 10 and 20. So that's, if we would have just waited for the orders to come in, every shop would have ordered one and it would have been deemed a failure. So that was the, that's the story. <laughs> Thanks and for sharing that story. That just created so much buzz. Um, I ended up going to Burton and it was because of that board that they made a pro model. Right. For, at Burton. For, for Burton, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so it seems to me that, you know, one of the takeaways I think with snowboarding specifically is that for whatever reason, when it all started, maybe yes, it was more family friendly, so there were women, women and there happened to be women in positions of power as well. Um, that sort of just team effort, even though you guys were at different brands and you know you guys were competing against each other, um, you know, that sense of camaraderie and that sense of really helping each other, I think that's, you know, from in my eyes, with my experience of all the different action sports, that's what helped take snowboarding into, I think, probably the, one of the most progressive, you know, industries for women specifically in sports. And so um, this is a question go moving on to, for Mickey, but, um, uh, for me, I see the value in not only, you know, drawing inspiration and learning from snowboarding and the industry and what you guys have done, but also um, having the other board sports and the related action sports, you know, cross over and, you know, be friends and work together. And that's also, you know, a reason for what we're doing. But with Mickey specifically, you taught, you told me about how, you know, you took what you learned in snowboarding and just that mentality you guys had and you applied that into a different sport, motocross. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what that experience was like and 
just how, um, you know, what your insight on that is. Okay. Um, well, I started in snowboarding in 1989, and that's when Sims was owned by Vision. I actually started in the skateboard industry. Um, I knew I always wanted to work in action sports, and it's just a little story for people who want to work in action sports. I was 15 years old, and I convinced the local store to let me restock the van's wall to just get, like, my foot in the door to be able to work at the shop. And then I eventually worked at the shop. Then I started working for Vision, and Vision owned Sims at the time. And I started snowboarding a little bit, and um, I had heard that there was, like, a demo program that you could call, you could talk to the Sims department, and you could borrow some boards. So I made a phone call from upstairs in the vision department, and the guy who answered the phone was Brad Stewart. And I said, hey, I want to borrow a snowboard. He's like, well, who are you? You snowboard? Uh, where are you? And I said, I'm upstairs. I'm to the right in the vision streetwear department. <laughs> and he goes, hang on. I'm coming right up. And that's the kind of community that we had. It's like he wanted to see who I was because I was one of the few snowboarders there. And I was so lucky because I had that opportunity to, um, uh, from, from that opportunity, I became the Sims team manager. And then I got the opportunity to work at Morrow, um, progress through there, and I left as the vice president of marketing. Um, there was a lot of uh, camaraderie between the women. Um, I think one of the things that I remember a lot was just like Shannon and Tina were always smiling and always making it, I mean, it was. They always made it like so inviting and you, f you felt like that's the sport that you wanted to be involved with. So um, years go on, and I did some stuff in freestyle motocross, and um, I started riding dirt bikes, and this is kind of weird, but you know, people would compliment me on my dirt bike riding. I'm like, well, I'm all right, but there's got to be good girls out there. There's got to be people who can really ride. So I kind of went searching for women who could ride dirt bikes really well, and I came across them and kind of found out that they didn't, have, they didn't have a pro series. The furthest they could go in racing was amateur. That was it. There was nothing for them. They didn't have a career. Um, so uh, I started the uh, Women's Motocross Association. And to me, it just seemed really natural that all I really needed to do was shine a spotlight on these women because I came from snowboarding. And there was all these strong and incredibly dynamic and inspirational women in snowboarding. It just seemed like it would be so easy with motocross. Uh, needless to say, it wasn't easy, <laughs> but it did, um, it did form into a professional series, and over the years, um, we had riders like Ashley Filick and Jessica Patterson and Tara Geiger, and I was able to go to the X Games and go to the, um, uh, the head guy at the X Games and convince him to bring women into Supercross at the X Games, and that really catapulted their careers. That deserves a clap. Thanks for sharing that. So I, this is a, more of a general question for all of you guys, but um, you know I have a lot of friends that are, you know, kind of this next generation of girls who work in the industry, and um, I think there's a lot to learn from you guys. Um, what, what if you could give kind of one piece of advice or one insight for this next generation of you know women that work in the industry? Because there are a lot of us at, at these companies, and there's a lot of companies now. Um, or even for younger athletes that are coming up, what would be <laughs> your one takeaway that you would want to pass on just from all of your experiences and all your, you know, trials and tribulations? It's a pretty intense question, but yeah, you can start. <laughs> that's, kind of, that's kind of a tough one. Um, now, I, I don't know. It just, for me, it was just about, you know, working hard and trying to just create value. Like, if you're... I can relate it really to women's motocross. Like I never tried to look at it as like, oh, this is something you should do or it's a charity that like you really should kind of help the women out. I just tried to really create a value in our program that could go head to head with anything else. And so for me, it's just, I don't know, just, you know, work hard and uh, work, work with the other women. I mean, we don't really have it that, I hate to say this, but we don't quite have that in motocross. And what you have, what you've done here with Mafia Sessions is incredible. If you can work together with the other women, y you'll, you'll grow together. And sometimes you think just, you know, I got to take care of me, but you, you really got to um, bring the rest of the women with you. I don't know. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, along those lines, I'd say also um, finding friends and like-minded people in the industry and um, supporting each other because in snowboarding it was a unique it's unique compared to 
surfing or professional skiing or um, skateboarding too, you know, where there's a lot of women who are really amazing surfer, surfers and skaters, but they don't have the opportunities, mainly because it's an older sport and a lot of women weren't necessarily involved at the very beginning of launching those sports. So I think we have an advantage and maybe that's something that people can learn from surfing um, or from uh, snowboarding. But I'd also say, you know, don't don't give up on that punk rock attitude. I mean, we were punkers, you know. We were, you know, full on punk rock. And so it's okay to be different and and just say, hey, man, I'm I'm gonna hike this mountain. I, I know I can't be on that lift, but I'm gonna, gonna I'm gonna go try it. And so that's where the camaraderie came across. It was almost post gender. It was like, well, you're just a snowboarder. It didn't really necessarily matter as much that you were male or or female. It's just like you're out there because you really had that passion. Um, so, you know, keep, keep that punk spirit going. <laughs> yeah, punk rock. Um, from a business perspective and, and working for several companies and starting a bunch of companies myself, um, one of my biggest pieces of advice would be um, to keep moving and keep progressing. And if you're stuck in a company that, that doesn't, you know, see your benefit or acknowledge you, don't be afraid to move on and find another position or go into something new and different. If you're in PR and you're going into marketing or you're going into retail marketing or whatever you're wanting to do, um, you know, every two or three years, like change it up because I see a lot of my girlfriends that have worked in companies for a long time and they get stuck in a position for six, seven years and and then something changes and, and you know, they, they've, and, and it's great. I mean, when you work for your first company, I, I mean, I did. I, you fall in love with it, and it's your, you know, it's it's your soulmate. You're like, this is what I'm doing, and this is my passion, and, and, and I'm defined just by this one company. But you can take that same spirit and that same motivation and take it to another company and another company. Or and, even start your own, and as even, many of you guys yeah, have shown. And, and that's the other thing, too, is, is not to be afraid to go out and start your own thing, because ultimately... Um, if you're going to put in all that hard work and, and dedication and time, um, you know, to start something or get a piece of something that all your sweat and, and labor can flourish and result into something, that's great. And if nothing else, you walk out with a lot of great experience. So there's my, my piece of advice. I think um, for me, the, the thread of my passion for action sports is really what drove everything. And my advice in the beginning was don't ever make a five-year plan because it will limit your opportunities. Because I never planned to run a snowboard company or work at EA Sports. It, I, you know, I was going to school f for, I have a phys ed degree and I didn't really know what I was gonna do. And so my passion brought me into communities that I couldn't, I couldn't deny, and it, the, it really um, blindsided my whole pathway that I had sort of, my parents had laid out for me. And it really took a turn and brought me to really exciting places, amazing mountains and beaches, lifelong friends, and experiences that I never dreamed that I could have, traveling the world with my like cool girlfriends. And we were punk rock, and we broke barriers, and we challenged rules, and I think the only thing that drove that and kept us doing that as hard as we did was that passion. And you know, I started out like windsurfing. I was teaching windsurfing in Maui, and then I, you know, met these guys in Whistler and started snowboarding. And then it took me my love of snowboarding took me to EA Sports. I didn't play video games. I went there to work on a snowboarding game. <laughs> and make sure that you know the snowboarding game felt cool to snowboarders and from that my passion brought they gave me the opportunity to start a lifestyle marketing program which you know I ran for 8 years at EA Sports and that job took me to mobile apps um, and marketing to you know teens and youth so i think that's my message is stay true to that passion find out what it is and it it doesn't matter if you don't have a path, and it doesn't matter if it's not all laid out. It's sometimes even more exciting to not know what's around that corner. And uh, the second part of that is community, because nothing happens if you keep your ideas to yourself. You need to share your ideas and form a community, and things happen when people get, get together. And I know 
one of the biggest, uh, most visible platforms of women in snowboarding was Sporting for Breast Cancer. And we all got involved in that in a huge way. And we couldn't believe in three months we launched the first event and everybody came out for it, everyone in the industry. And I mean, Lisa, everybody that was involved, both of you girls, driving forces. And, but people came out and we ourselves were blown away. And I think when I've worked on the tour and in the booth and when you see girls come up and they're so excited, we're like, wow. We made a niche for girls to feel part of the sport in a very big way. So, um, community. And now with social media, I have so much opportunity to do that. Mm. Um, yeah, community is key. And I think uh, from an athlete perspective, um, I would just say it's important to be an, ab an ambassador because there's more to being an athlete than just focusing on your sport. Um, you can inspire and encourage the next generation and um, just motivate girls to pursue their whatever their passion is. So I think it's really important to see outside your sport for the bigger picture and um, just be a good representative in your sport. Uh, definitely. Um, I mean, everybody said it and as an athlete or in a skateboarder, it, it's important to be with other people that really help support what you want to do, especially in skateboarding. You're like, there, girls don't skate. What do you mean you're skating? You know, I had to deal with that forever. And I always just had to keep myself with people that really believed in me and, and supported me for what I love to do because I've loved skateboarding since I was really little and it is just, I mean, I remember seeing these girls skate at this skate park and that validated to me that girls could skate and just seeing those girls. So I know how important that is to be out there and have other girls see girls do it. So you set a standard and, uh, you know, so you, it's just, you just gotta not, if people are gonna always try to knock you down and tell you you can't do something in a sport, especially being a girl. And so you need to be with people that are always saying, yeah, you know, and pushing you and helping you. And also the community and being together and helping each other because if you just are out by yourself and looking out for yourself, you're not gonna really get very far. And and I learned a lot of those things through snowboarding because the girls were so tight and, you know, I learned how to be more like that and uh, it was cool because that's how the girls were and it was so rewarding to support everybody, you know, w and just have that, like, you know, everybody, whoever won or whatever, we just all were happy for each other and uh, so that's just so important and, um, and, uh, it, it, and just, you know, just doing what you love to do and being positive and uh, knowing that if that's what you want to do, just be with people that are that way and, and believe in you and um, just keep that positive outlook on it and don't focus on the negative. <laughs> Some really good advice. Uh, I have one last question and then we're going to open it up to you guys for, you know, some Q&A. Um, I want to ask this to Kathleen. Um, so having, you know, you guys have seen everything from the beginning till now. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically because with Label Networks, you're, you know, on, you're studying the trends and doing the research. Um, what do you think, you know, from your perspective needs to happen in order for women in action sports to continue to progress and, you know, get the respect and attention and even just the numbers that, you know, we deserve. Because it's, it's, it's gotten better, but it's definitely not there yet. So I um, just wanted to ask you what you think, you know. Well, um, from our perspective and the research that we have done for the last 14 years, um, we see that more and more women are interested in learning action sports, specifically and in this order, um, skateboarding, surfing, and snowboarding. And um, their uh, aspirations to learn the sport are twice as high in terms of percentages as it is with males in the same age group of 13 to 25 year olds. 
So if you look at the aspiration uh, perspective of this in terms of versus the participation perspective, you realize that there's a huge market opportunity and there's huge opportunity for brands and for events and for young people to get into these um, sports. Um, and I think that a lot of young women are really you know, trying, trying to be a part of these sports, but it's, it's difficult when there aren't events to compete in, you know, or when there isn't the equal prize money, or there isn't the motivation from their family, or um, from their boyfriends, or the industry. So I yeah, think that that's challenging. Sponsor support. And sponsor support's a real issue, and you know, surfing's going through a, a significant change right now because of the sponsorship issues with women. Um, so from the research perspective, we see participation numbers increasing among the women themselves and ent entering into these sports, especially you know things like motocross too, BMX and wakeboarding too. Um, but the, on the flip side, we still have a industry that um, doesn't have as many women in roles of you know powerful roles of manager and business roles and so on. So it's still that struggle of s showing frankly, you know, the profit that could be made if it was uh, an even playing field.